Well, hello everybody and welcome to Live with Lon uh, this morning. Uh, I hope that you're having a good morning uh, or whatever time of day you're listening to this. And we are going to continue with our study in the Gospels uh, and going uh, exegetically and expositionally deep into the Gospels. And then always asking the question, how does this apply to my life? And we'll do all of that, but first, I believe we need to pray. So, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we are a needy people. First of all, we are a needy people when it comes to this virus that is infecting our world. And Lord, we pray that you would take a hand against this virus and that you would tell it to stop, and it would simply stop because you commanded it to. Or, Lord, that you would quickly allow a treatment and a vaccine to be developed successfully to protect us against this virus. Oh, God, I pray for mercy for each of our families, and I pray for mercy for the whole human race, dear God. Even though we know we don't deserve it, we ask for mercy, Lord, mercy against this virus, please. And Lord, we also are a needy people right now here in America. And Lord, I want to pray that you would help all of us as Americans to become far more sensitive to the issues that are being raised by those demonstrating regarding racial justice <clears throat> Lord, I pray that you would forgive those of us who need to be forgiven, and many of us do, for our inaction and for our rationalizations and for our lack of urgency to make sure that there is justice here in America and in our churches not just for African-American people, but for all people, for people of poverty, for people who have special needs and disabilities. Lord, for people of color and of people, for people of nationality all around the world who are here in America and around the world, go oh God, help us to have the heart of Christ as we're going to see it today, that he loved all people the same. All people the same. And Lord Jesus, I realize that we will never fully overcome racism or any other sin, because that's what it is. It's a sin that is in our sinful human nature. We will never fully beat any of these till Jesus returns in his power to give us glorified bodies with no sin nature. I understand that. But Lord, in the meantime, please help us and empower us and motivate us to do what we can. Now, Lord, we can, can, uh, can commit our time in the Word of God to you. Use it in our hearts and lives today and change our hearts and lives today because we sat under the teaching of the eternal word of God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Well, okay, now it's time to study the word of God. And remember, we are in a study of the Gospels. And it's not a tall study, a grande study, a venti study, a la Starbucks, but it's a Trenta study where we're going to try to go deep and really exegete and exposit the Word of God and bring truth out that applies to our heart and life. And so that's what we're going to do. We're in Matthew chapter 8 today. And remember that we're using uh, the New King James uh, translation of the Bible. And so Matthew chapter 8, uh, here we go. Verse 1, now when Jesus had come down from the mountain, 
great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came up and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, we should talk for a moment about leprosy in the time of Jesus. Leprosy, or as it's more commonly referred to today as Hansen's disease, uh, was very common in the days of Jesus. And leprosy was a dreaded disease. It was a disease everyone feared that they might get uh, because it was such a terrible disease. <clears throat> Hansen's disease is a disease uh, that causes um, uh, your, your flesh literally uh, to rot away and disfigures people in ways that are horrible. I've got a couple of pictures here I want to show you, and I'm not trying to gross us out or to be insensitive but this story makes no sense if you and I don't understand the horror of leprosy. So let me show you a couple pictures. First, uh, the disfigurement of this person's face from leprosy. Look at this. And then look at the fingers of this person uh, as a result of leprosy. The leprosy itself didn't uh, chew these fingers up, but often what would happen is because people lose their feel, the feeling in their fingers and their toes, they would, they would uh, not be able to tell when their fingers and their toes were being damaged and they would get infections that would cause uh, the loss of their limbs. Uh, and, and this is, so this is leprosy. Now, the great problem with leprosy is that it's contagious. Today, we have antibiotics uh, that won't cure leprosy 100%, but most of the time they will keep it under control and they will keep it dormant. Uh, back, of course, in Jesus' day, there were no antibiotics. And so, um, because it was contagious, the people who had leprosy, had to be separated from healthy people. Uh, Leviticus chapter 13 and 14 tell us about this in the Old Testament, that people with leprosy are to, put, are to be put outside the camp of Israel and are to be isolated and rejected uh, and, haha, I want a word, quarantined. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and no one was to go near them because they were contagious, obviously. So, uh, you remember the movie Ben-Hur, uh, I think. And in the movie Ben-Hur, remember his mother and his sister caught leprosy. And they were sent out of uh, the city of Jerusalem to live in a leper colony uh, where, all, where the food was just lowered down on a rope, if you remember. And no one was allowed to go near them. And when people saw them... They cried out, lepers, lepers, and ran away from them. Uh, uh, they were required by rabbinic law when they were in the presence of anyone without leprosy to declare themselves and, and, and cry out, lepers, lepers, about themselves. Stay away. Uh, can you imagine the impact that this had on people? And not just physically but emotionally uh, and spiritually, uh, to be isolated like this, to be rejected like this, to be shoved aside like this, to be uh, treated like this, uh, and, and, and the, the loneliness that they had to grapple with and the rejection that they had to grapple with. This was a terrible diagnosis to have leprosy. And this man had a bad case. In Luke's gospel, it says that he was covered in leprosy. And he comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. You can take away this leprosy just by a word, just by a thought, 
All right, now let's see what happens. Verse 3, and Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Wow, how great is that? I love it. When Jesus heals you, Jesus heals you right. His leprosy didn't go away in a week or a month or 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 a, a year. It went away immediately. Immediately he was cleansed. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. The power of God. No one could heal a leper in the days of Jesus. There was no treatment, but Jesus spoke the word and it was healed. But I love what the Bible says here. Look back at this verse again, verse 3. It says, And Jesus put out his hand and touched the leper. Friends, nobody touched lepers. <laughs> nobody even wanted to get near a leper. I mean, they did social distancing <laughs> in those days when it came to lepers. Uh, and... and Jesus not only said, okay, I'll heal you, but before the leper was healed, would you notice that? Before the leper was healed, Jesus touched him. And the Greek word here means to not just to go, oh, and touch him like that. No, no. Jesus put his hand on him. Jesus, the, the Bible, the Greek word means Jesus grabbed him in a loving and friendly way. I don't know whether it was on the arm or whether it was on the, the shoulder or the whether it was on the forehead or whether Jesus put his arm around the man. The Bible doesn't say, but Jesus embraced this man with a touch while he was still contagious. While he was still contagious. Jesus did something nobody would have ever done, and that is touch this man. Don't you love that? Wow. Listen, friends, Jesus is trying to send a message here. The message he's trying to send, not only to this leper, but to everybody that was around, and to you and me today, because it's recorded in the Bible, is that I don't care how much people have rejected or you or me, I don't care how much of an outcast they consider us to be. I don't care how much of a leper, spiritually speaking, uh, figuratively speaking, we might be in other people's eyes. Jesus is always willing to embrace us. He is always willing to take us to himself. Isn't that wonderful? Hey, it's just like the prodigal son. You remember in Luke chapter 15, the parable of the prodigal son. And the father in the prodigal son story represents God. The son who had run away and was living in the pig pen represents us. But folks, when the son came home and repented, what did the father do? I love this. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around his son. He kissed his son. And he rejoiced with his son. Now listen, that boy smelled terrible. That boy had been living in the hog pen, in the pig pen, with the pigs, with the slop, and all of the excrement that was in there for who knows how long since he'd had a bath. Who knows how long he'd been in that pig pen. Now, the Bible does not say he took a bath before he came home or shower. Uh, he, 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 he could probably, you could probably smell him before you could see him. Uh, uh, and yet his father didn't come up to him and say, Ooh, yeah, you can come home, but before I, I touch you, can you, let's go give you a bath. No, 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 no. The father grabbed him just like he was, hugged him just like he was, embraced him just like he was, kissed him just like he was, even though probably nobody else would have done that. Why? Because, friends, that's the heart of God. Listen to me, my friend. I don't care how rejected you've been. I don't care how much you have been treated like an outcast. 
I don't care what people have said about you. I don't care how bad you have sinned. I don't care. It doesn't matter how people feel about you. What matters is how God feels about you. And God, just like with the leper, just like with the prodigal son, is willing to take you just as you are, embrace you, love you. And if you'll give your heart to him, he will cleanse you like he did this leper. And he will give you power over the sins that you can't beat on, on your own. And he will forgive what you've done in the past and put it under the blood of Christ. Make it BC before Christ. Make it AH, ancient history in the sight of God. This is the heart of God. This is what he did for me when I came to him at the age of 21 years old, on the last 22 actually. Man, I was an outcast. I was dirty and filthy, both in mind and in spirit and in body. Nobody really had much good for me. And yet Jesus took me just like this leper, embraced me, forgave my sin, gave me power by the Holy Spirit to live a different way. And that's what he'll do for you. If you've never come to Christ, and you're convinced God doesn't want you. You're too far gone. Friends, you can't be any far gone, more far gone than a leper. <laughs> you can't be any more untouchable to society than a leper. And if Jesus touched and embraced him and healed him, he'll do the same for you. He'll do the same for you. Just come humbly and give him your life and you won't believe what he'll make out of your life. Now, let's move on. <clears throat> Verse 4. And the leprosy was clean, and Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest in Jerusalem, and offer a gift, the gift that Moses commanded, as a testimony to them, that is, the priests. Now, why did what is this all about? Well, in Leviticus chapter 13 and 14, you're, uh, we're told, the Bible says, that if anyone has leprosy, but somehow, some way, miraculously, they're cured, uh, they're to go to the priest uh, in those days at the tabernacle, in these days at the temple in Jerusalem, and present themselves to the priest and allow the priest to examine them and to pronounce their healing is legitimate and that it's genuine. And so this is what Jesus is talking about. Take the offering, the thank offering that he would present to God, uh, the healed man and, or woman, and um, go see the priest and let the priest confirm this is a legitimate healing. Okay. Well, why did he say to him, don't tell anyone? He said, I don't know. Well, there's a reason. Let me tell you why. Jesus did not want word of this healing to get to the priest in Jerusalem before the man did. And for them to hear that Jesus had supposedly healed a leper. And then, in an attempt to... Um, to discredit the ministry of Jesus and to refuse to uh, verify a healing that Jesus had done, when the man got there, since the priest had already heard about it, they would not certify the miracle. They would say, ah, you all, you, you never had leprosy. We, you, you were never really sick. This is not a real healing. This is just a sham. You understand? Uh, Jesus did not want that to happen. He wanted the man to show up without giving these priests any advance warning. And then when they certified it, then to find out that it was Jesus who did it. They didn't want to certify Jesus' healings. Are you kidding? They're trying to reject Jesus as the Messiah. So you understand now why Jesus said, don't tell anybody. Just go let the priest certify you. And then... You can go tell the whole world what great things God has done for you. 
All right, now that's our passage. And you say, well, Lon, that's a pretty short passage, and it's only like four verses, and it, I don't really, I mean, huh, you know, uh, praise God they've got treatment for leprosy today, and that you don't see it much anymore, and if I ever got it, I could be treated, uh, but I don't really see what this passage has to do with me. Uh, <laughs> I mean, well, what difference does it make to my life? Well, I believe it does, and I'm going to tell you right now, and you know, at McLean Bible Church, when I was pastoring there, uh, we always used to scream, so what? Also, what means is now that we've studied the Bible, now let's ask the question, what difference does this make to me? Uh, right? I mean, I've told you, if a preacher doesn't tell people, so what? and how he's no good to them. And so every message, uh, uh, just about, uh, we, would, we would all together out in the audience, we'd all say, so what? It kind of started decades ago as just a little mnemonic device. And then people got into it and they got, you know, everybody was having fun, shouting, so what? And, and we would compare the services to see who would shout it uh, the loudest? Uh, on Sunday, it would always be the 1230 service, almost without exception. Even though it wasn't the largest service, man, those people got into it. But of all the services, Arlington, the Arlington campus, we got a trophy and called it the So What Trophy. And, I, and one weekend, we had a competition to see who would win it. You say, Lon, that is the cheesiest thing I, well, you might think so, but we had fun with it. And the Arlington campus won the So What Trophy. And so if any of you are watching and you attend the Arlington campus of McLean Bible Church, God bless you. You still hold uh, the So What Trophy. Now, having said all of that, <sighs> we cannot go ahead and and not say so what, Right? We have to do this. This is like tradition, tradition, no, 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 right? Okay. Sorry, ready? Nice and loud. Even if you just say it in your head, nice and loud. Here we go. Come on now. One, two, three. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And as my good friend Jackie Gleason used to say, although I never met him, he used to always say how sweet it is. <laughs> yes, ma'am. All right. Now, so what? Well, I want you to look back with me in chapter 8. Look at verse 2. And behold, a leper came and worshipped Jesus, saying, Lord. He believed in Jesus already. Believed he was the Messiah. Called him Lord, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Boy, is this a power-packed verse. First of all, as I said, this man's a believer. He believes Jesus is the Messiah or he wouldn't have called him Lord. So whatever is going on in this verse is for us as believers to benefit from. This man was a believer, and he came to Jesus and said, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Now listen, when I was going through uh, school, uh, in high school, English, I had to learn the difference between can and may. Most people misuse this. We, uh, we do. Can means that you are capable of doing something. May means that you have permission to do something. Do you remember that? Yeah. Hey, I love the movie Avalon, if you've never seen it. It's a wonderful movie. And there's a little scene in there where, this little, where the grandson of the man who stars in the movie is asking his teacher if he can go out and use the restroom in elementary school. And she says, you can... 
but you may not. And he asked again, can I go to the restroom? And she says, you can, but you may not. And even the grandfather came in and didn't understand the difference. But of course, the difference is, yes, you have the power to go to the bathroom. You have the ability to go to the bathroom, but I'm not giving you permission to do it. Now, notice this man says, Lord, if you are willing, he doesn't say you may make me clean because God doesn't need to ask permission from anybody to do anything. He has permission to do whatever he wants to do. He is the authority in the universe. So that's not what the man says. He says, Lord, if you, if you want to, you can make me clean. You have the ability to make me clean. You have the power to make me clean. You are the omnipotent Messiah of the universe, and I understand that. You are the omnipotent, almighty, sovereign God, and if you want, you can make me clean. Okay, we got that. But I, the important part of this is what he said in the middle. Lord, you can make me clean if you are willing. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Uh, the point here that I'm trying to make, my friends, is that this guy came to the Lord Jesus with uh, what, I guess the only word that I've got for it is he came with submissive faith. Submissive faith. He came and he said, Lord, you can do this. But I'm not sure if you're willing. If you're willing, I know you can. But I'm asking you, Lord, if you're willing. And if you're not willing, I'll accept it. And if you are willing, then please do it. Now, I think often one of the biggest problems we have as believers in Jesus is unanswered prayer. We come to the Lord and we say, Lord, you can do this. You can do that. that. Friends, there's not a thing in the world we can come to the Lord with that he can't do. That's a given. And so we ask him to do things for us, whether they're small things or big things. We ask him to uh, heal some medical problem that we've got, or we ask him to help us get a new job, or we ask him to <clears throat> help us have a child if we're uh, 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 wanting a, a first child or another child or an adopted child, we come to him and we say, Lord, uh, I'd like you to uh, answer this prayer. I'd like you to help my child in school. I'd like you to do this. I'd like you to do that. Perfectly okay. This man came and said, Lord, I'd like you to heal me. But it's all depending on whether you're willing. On whether you feel Listen to me now, that at this moment in time, what is best for me and for your sovereign plan for my life and for the universe is that I be healed. And if you feel that, I know you can do it, and you will, if, Lord, you don't believe that it's the right time and the right thing to happen right now in light of your sovereign plan, then, Lord, I understand that. I will submit to that. And, Lord, I will rejoice in that, as hard as it may be. Do you understand? This is what he came with, submissive faith. Lord, I know you can do anything, but you, you make the call whether this is the right thing to do for me right at this moment in time. Now, my dear friends, as believers in Jesus, this kind of submissive faith is the kind of faith that we need to have. I have come to God so many times and said, Lord, would you please do this? Would you please do that? Would you please do the other thing? And you know what? Sometimes he's done it immediately, and sometimes he hasn't done it immediately. Sometimes he's made me wait weeks or months or years or even decades. And, and 
I keep asking him, and he keeps deciding that at this given moment when I'm asking him, it's not the best and the right thing to do for me or for his plan for my life. You say, how do you know he decided that? Because friends, God always does what's best for us. Uh, he gives us good things without limit. And so if it had been best for my life and his plan for my life, he would have done it. But it, in his sovereignty and his wisdom, it wasn't. And I had to wait. This is hard. Some of you right now are right there. You are right there. And God, by not doing what you're wanting, is trying to tell you, hey, I love you, but this is not the right thing for me to do. Maybe ever, because some of the things I used to ask God to do, I don't ask him for anymore. As I matured and I grew, I realized mm, it's not really the best thing. I think I'll stop asking for that. Sometimes that happens. Or he's like, this, I'm going to do this for you, but I'm, it, this is not the right time. Remember with God, uh, timing is everything with God. Uh, God's will and God's timing are both important. And we can have identified God's will sometimes, but we, we, we got to wait for his timing. So this is what this man was asking. Praise God. And God said, hey, it is the right time. And it is the right thing for me to do for you in my plan. And bam, baby, it was done. So let me just say to you, if you are in one of those situations where you're waiting and God, you're saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can do this. And God's saying, I, I, I know uh, that I can, but right now, uh, I, this, this is not the right time for me to do it. And I need you to wait then friend, cheerfully, we need to have submissive faith. And this is hard. This is hard. And the only way we can have submissive faith is to believe that we have an almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, sovereign God who loves us and always does what's best for us, and would do this for us if it were best. We have to believe that about God. And if we believe that about God, we can be cheerful even if he doesn't do what we want right this second. This is why Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Give thanks in all things, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks, even if he doesn't answer your prayer right now. Because this, what you're, where you are, with even an unanswered prayer, is God's will. That's uh, you, you're right in the middle of God's will, right where you are. So give thanks. Now it can also mean give thanks in all things, because giving thanks is God's will for our life. You say, which does it mean? Uh, it means both, because both are biblically true. But give thanks in all things, because this, where I am right now. Is God's will for my life, not what I'm asking for right this second, and therefore I can give thanks. You know, <clears throat> I've asked God so many times to heal my daughter, Jill, whom you know has multiple disabilities. She has Dravet syndrome, D-R-A-V, like Victor E-T. Google it. She has seizures, she has mental retardation, she has physical disabilities, uh, all kinds of things. And I've asked God so many times to heal her, heal her. Lord, if you are willing, you can make Jill whole. Yes, that's right. And God has never done it. And she's 28 now. She's better, praise the Lord, much better than she used to be. Much fewer seizures, but healed completely? No. And I've had to just accept that, that Lord, for whatever reason, this is God's will in Christ Jesus for Jill and God's, reason, God's will in Christ Jesus for me and Brenda and our family. I can only do that by believing all those things I just said about God. And I do believe them. And if you will believe them, you can be cheerful 
even when God says, I'm not answering that prayer right now. Sorry, it's not right. It's not best, and I'm not doing it. You know, I'm going to close with a couple of verses from the book of Daniel. Uh, do you remember that uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were going to get thrown into the fiery furnace unless they bowed down to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 3, remember that? And, 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 and Nebuchadnezzar says to them, either bow down or I'm throwing you in there. Now, they couldn't bow down to a statue, an idol. They were Jewish. They, and, and they knew the Bible, you know, you shall have no other God before me. They knew the Ten Commandments. So he said, and I'm going to throw you in there, and, and you know, you'll have to call on your God to save you because nobody else is going to. And listen to what they said. I'm in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, if you're going to throw us in the fire, our God, whom we serve, is able, he can, right, deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Now look at verse 18, but if not. And some versions, I love it, the New American Standard, the New International translated, but even if he does not, even if he doesn't rescue us, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image you've set up. Hey, Nebuchadnezzar, God can do this, and we know he can do it, and if it's his will and his purpose for us and his plan, he will do it. But if it's not his will, his purpose, and his plan, even if he doesn't do it, we are not abandoning God. We are staying loyal to God. And we are going to accept with submissive faith the will of God. Wow. This is what I'm saying. We all have to do this at some point in our Christian lives. And hopefully we do it cheerfully because we know the character of our God. You know, Mercy Me did a song, a wonderful song based on this verse, Daniel 3.18. And even if he doesn't, we're still going to stay true to you. I love this song. Uh, even if you know it, it's okay. Read the words carefully and let this song encourage your soul. Lord, if you're willing, I know you can heal me, but even if you don't, I'm still sticking with you. Here's the song. God bless you. See you next week, Lord willing.